Okay, dear honored guests, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear Wilfried Stadler and the entire GLOBA team, dear Sonia and Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, when Wilfried asked me if I would hold the laudation uh, for Jeffrey Sachs today, I tried to give the best Austrian impression that a German like myself could muster. I said, ich freue mich narisch. I'm madly happy. It doesn't translate very well. Um, um, but I have to caution you, you won't find a lot of bibliographical details uh, in my laudation. Just go to the Wikipedia entry for Jeffrey, you find him there. I try to give a very personal account uh, uh, as a sustainability scholar myself for the last decade uh, and a half here. So it was uh, more than six years ago, uh, in the springtime of 2011, when the world was uh, beautiful and Obama was president and not Donald Trump, uh, the 17th International Sustainable Development Research Conference was held at Columbia University's Earth Institute, Jeffries Institute, in New York City. The conference topic back then still appears timely to this very day, moving toward a sustainable future, opportunity, and challenges. I had been to other conferences in the US before, but this was my first sustainability conference there, and I was really curious how my colleagues framed sustainability and its related issues in a North American context, where our commonalities might be and also where our differences uh, could lie, and above all, what we can learn from each other. The first day, however, and I really remember this, uh, was kind of a culture so shock for uh, me as a German scholar. Uh, I heard uh, Nina Fedorov, a US molecular biologist, and she kicked off the conference by arguing that organic agriculture was not a significant part of a truly sustainable food system, and the way forward to feed nine billion people would be genetically modified organisms. Klaus Lackner, an energy physicist, followed shortly advocating large-scale energy infrastructure projects, including nuclear, without any reference to alternative, more decentralized solutions. To me, after this first day, the entire discourse in the US appeared to be stuck in a loop that I thought European sustainability research had left behind a couple of years ago. While still feeling puzzled, the last day rolled along, and suddenly, Jeffrey Sachs appeared. Um, and he really appeared. He had flown in from the Middle East the night before, so he just came straight from JFK. Uh, but he was, uh, at least on the outside, appearing very fresh and energetic. And his keynote uh, was called Beyond the Tipping Point, Global Governance in an Era of Environmental Upheaval. And it brought a certain urgency to the conference, which was well needed at that time. From the outset, it was very apparent to me and to all the others that this man would not beat around the bush when it comes to sustainability and the future of our planet. He made it very clear to us researchers that despite our best efforts, the world was not moving towards more sustainability. And that this is only partly due to science. It is true, doing sustainability research is probably the most complex undertaking in the history of science so far. It requires a close cooperation between different disciplines from very different academic cultures and also beyond the academia. It also requires a very critical reflection within each academic discipline about their underlying assumptions and ideas. But most important of all, and this was the message that I got uh, uh, at that day, science is not enough. Science will not save the world. Jeffrey emphasized this when he talked about vested interests, business and political power, and the inner workings of the media industry in the US. The talk is still available online. I just checked it up uh, earlier this week. Unless researchers do not take into account the powers beyond the institution's doors, they will always fail to see their findings implemented. Back in 2011, Jeffrey Sachs pictured the US as a blocker when it comes to battling climate change, also oh, much has changed, uh, and implementing sustainability with a political industrial media complex preventing and undermining real progress. Maybe, just maybe, uh, dear Jeffrey, you thought to yourself in 2015 when President Obama was among those who secured the Paris Agreement on limiting human-made climate ch change to well below two degrees, that things just might take a good turn in the end after all. But well, uh, then you good folks across the Atlantic 
Trump did huge last year, and now we're living with the consequences. It was fascinating for me to read your latest thoughts uh, on the dangerous collusion between big money and big data on targeting voters very specifically with messages they were most compelling to favor. The US Republican presidential campaign in 2016 provides many insights how data can be used to get across the most distorted and unreal political messages and change voting patterns if you are able to throw enough money at it. Back then, in 2011, you had one hopeful example for us as well, a regional cooperation of countries with the European Union as a role model for achieving ambitious sustainability-oriented policies and setting global standards. I just can imagine how puzzled you must have felt last year, also in summer, just before you uh, 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 did it, uh, that some of us Europeans would so carelessly vote to exit this great project of the European Union. And I myself, and maybe you in the room as well, I just feel as puzzled I, uh, as I did last year in June when the Brexit referendum rolled around. In the end, I do remember your conclusion back then, that in order to tackle sustainability and build a better world for the many, and not just the few, we need a global knowledge framework linking science with politics and ethics. Science alone is not enough to save the world. For you, Jeffrey, this was clear on that day in May 2011, although I believe your insight came at the end of a learning curve over your own involvement with politics for many years. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeffrey Sachs is an economist. This alone would not be remarkable, but more than 30 years ago, he chose to step beyond the safe walls of academia and get involved with politics, blurring the lines between his work as a researcher and actively consulting governments of countries in difficult economic situations. He became famous for his fieldwork as a clinical economist, as he called himself, uh, in the 1980s in South America, and then in the 1990s in Eastern Europe. For an economist, this was dangerous, not because of all the things that might and eventually probably did go wrong sometimes in the field, but because of how other economists might perceive this. I can only try to imagine how some of the economists who stayed safely back home raised a brow, an eyebrow or two about someone from economics, the crown jewel of all social sciences and so proud of its abstract mathematical modeling prowess, who went outside academia and actively attempted to change the world for the better. Probably the same people gleefully commented on Jeffrey's experiences with Russia in the late 1990s that were not so successful, but this reveals more about those who gloat than about the men who actually tried to do something. Economics, I used to study it back in the days, is a strange beast. And economists are probably even stranger ones. Economics is the only scientific discipline, apart from theology, if you like to call that a science, that calls its history dogma history, especially in the German tradition, we like to do that. Um, as if it would constitute a belief system. Even stranger than this is the habitus of those practicing the discipline, suggesting that this particular social science is somehow harder or more objective than other social sciences. Economics, as one uh, used to say, as the physics of social science. This self-image has been firmly established and reinforced since at least the neoclassical turn in economics in the late 1800s with Alfred Marshall, who named uh, his uh, uh, textbook back then not political economy, as Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, and Karl Marx did. No, he called it plainly economics. Joseph Schumpeter and John Maynard Keynes notwithstanding, economics has prided itself from being somewhat aloof from the messy world of social action, especially from politics and power. And Jeffrey himself most likely realized this years later, uh, that situations like, for example, in Russia in the 1990s could not be solved by applying his best economics, but would require taking into account domestic politics, culture, um, the political industrial uh, complex, as well as geopolitics between the United States and Russia at that time. Economics without politics is just an intellectual board game. It needs to open its view beyond the models towards the reality 
of the political economy, which is the true object of its inquiry anyway. When Jeffrey forcefully advocated linking science with politics and ethics back in 2011, this was probably a, a result of that insight, just as his clear view on power structures, on vested interests and asymmetries in our public discourse. If we acknowledge now that politics influences everything that any science dreams up, how much more is that true for something we might call sustainability science? Sustainability entails at least three different elements, in my view. First, it provides an imperative to use resources in, in such a way that they remain usable for you and others in the long run. Second, it implies a global form of social justice to institutionally ensure that the needs of the future and the world's poorest are not compromised. And third, it requires dramatic change towards an economy that is embedded within societal and natural boundaries and not disconnected from them. The change that is required by following sustainability is pushing against many vested interests um, that are all too eager to corrupt our best efforts. That's why sustainability is not just a science. In order to really pursue it, it has to be a form of politics and, most of all, a kind of ethics for a global age of the risk society, to borrow a term from Ulrich Beck. It is precisely in this Bermuda Triangle of sustainability that Jeffrey played a decisive role in the past and continues to play a, a role today. Now it comes a bit of Wikipedia part, sorry about that. On behalf of then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, he chaired the UN Millennium Project from 2002 to 2006, which was tasked with developing a concrete, concrete action plan to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs. Jeffrey's own work in economic development, especially in Africa from 95 onwards, was part of the groundwork for the MDGs. The spirit of these goals was bold, to reduce extreme poverty and hunger globally, to ensure safe access to natural resources and a healthy natural environment for everyone. Jeffrey was strongly arguing for the beneficial impacts of these MDGs on how they help to markedly reduce poverty, for instance, or for increasing schooling rates in developing countries. To quote you, global goals help to galvanize a global effort. And to quote you, quoting John F. Kennedy, by defining our goal more clearly, by making it seem more manageable and less remote, we can help all people to see it, to draw hope from it, and to move irresistibly towards it. And this is even more so with the successor of the MDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Jeffrey is currently an advisor to UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres and an advocate for the SDGs. And these are even bolder goals. They are more daring than the MDGs. What always touches me when I read them is among the first goals. It's not saying that we want to reduce extreme poverty. No, it says end it, end extreme poverty. Um, and the same is with hunger. It doesn't say reduce hunger. No, it says end it. End it by 2030. No one on this planet should suffer from hunger and fear of starvation. For me as a scholar, your argument about the epistemic qualities of goals like the SDGs are most fascinating. Such great goals, you said, spur epistemic communities, networks of expertise, knowledge, and practice into action around sustainable development challenges. When bold goals are set, those communities of knowledge and practice come together to recommend practical pathways to achieve results. Such a great mobilization of actors and knowledge is, of course, a political process. Ending poverty and hunger, battling climate change, adapting an economy to the realities of a finite planet are not scientific goals. They are political goals. And more than that, they are providing a normative global framework the baseline of a truly global sustainability ethics. These global baselines, this ethics of sustainability, as it is codified very clearly with the SDGs and how to measure their implementation, is now one of the last grand ideas to unite all countries from both the global north and the south. It might as well be the last global idea standing when we look what happened to the idea of human rights. I already referred to the situation in the US as well as in the UK to Trump and Brexit. 
The election of Donald Trump, just as the referendum result uh, for taking the UK out of the European Union, are signs for crumbling ideas, for deteriorating global vision and responsibility, for a diminishing of trust in ourselves and in our ability to turn the boat around and steer the world towards more sustainable futures. As much as we might empathize with feelings of being overwhelmed by the world with resignation in the light of all the challenges around us, but the replacement of a more cosmopolitan, more globalist outlook that we can see currently on offer is an ugly revenant from our own past. Nationalism and the fear of the other. This might be an attractive escape route for some, especially for those who ruthlessly exploit it for their own political gains, but the world won't go away. Climate change won't go away. And sustainability cannot be achieved by closing borders or by turning inwards. I do have some hope that the rise of nationalism, along with authoritarianism, can be contained. In Europe, we are struggling, but we have not fallen. Anglo-America appears to be more in peril. Maybe it suffers from some sort of post-imperial stress disorder. I don't know. Um, but to me, it becomes imperative today that the SDGs and all processes connected to it, including the COP process, by the way, and the Hello to Bonn, the climate conference has just started there, they all remain on top of the political agenda. And we, as scholars, need to increase our efforts to assist in pursuing them in our research, but also, and maybe even more so, in our outreach to politics and the rest of society. This, of course, requires something that you are not being taught at university or in research projects. It requires courage. Civil courage, würden wir auf Deutsch sagen. The same courage Jeffrey Sachs showed when he first entered the political minefield of consulting governments, but even more so when he understood that consulting is also not enough, that some form of scholarly activism is much more needed when it comes to sustainability. In Germany, we are discussing how economics could be a transformative science for adapting and changing society towards sustainability. Transformation research might be a dirty word for some, especially for traditional economists, but science and especially economics, has always been transformative. Scholars like Keynes or Hayek wanted to change politics. They wanted to transform societies for the better. And even if you don't want to have any part in this as a scientist, if you want to confine yourself to a Weberian Wertfreiheit, doing value-free science, you cannot. Just as we cannot close our borders, and turn away from ourselves. As scholars, we cannot live a professional life free of becoming normative, of getting our hands dirty, like it or not. A science, like economics, is always deeply normative and thus transformative. And now, dear Jeffrey, dear guests, the connection to Globart and the reason why you are being honored tonight with the Globart Award hopefully have become a bit clearer. Globart states as its mission to encourage people to implement their own ideas, share their thoughts, and make an effort for sustainable society. To encourage sharp-minded, critical, and energetic people to tell stories of success, to give the architects of the future a stage, and to inspire them and others to pursue of putting their ideas into reality. Given the critical junction that we collectively find ourselves in, a time in which global temperatures and global tempers are rising at an unprecedented rate, and the center is dangerously close to lose its hold. People like Jeffrey Sachs are needed to keep us pushing the rock up the hill regardless. To remind us that hope is not lost when you dare to transgress your own boundaries, to act as a role model of compassionate activism, while at the same time remaining an outstanding scholar in your own field. Professional excellence, moral integrity, and compassionate activism. These are the ingredients for truly transformative sustainability scholarship, and I am deeply honored to be here with you all tonight to hand over the 2017 Global Award to Jeffrey Sachs. Thank you. Thank you.